All right then, um, let's get going. Uh, this week we're going to do a little bit on magma chamber processes, which is kind of a follow-up from the end of last week when we were talking about um, plumes in large igneous provinces. And then we're going to change direction sharply and go look at subduction zones. All right. Um, so yeah, we'll just start off by talking about what magma chambers are, um, how they relate to intrusions and cumulate rocks. So at the end of last week, we were talking about um, the importance of uh, these kind of complex plumbing systems in, and magma chambers in controlling large igneous province uh, magma evolution. And if you remember, we said that continental flood basalts are usually pretty evolved, um, but we're, they should be you know, high temperature primitive uh, magmas coming from plumes. And what's happening in between is that they are crystallizing a lot. Um, so now we're actually going to look at the areas where they are crystallizing. And in particular, we're going to talk about two intrusions, uh, the Skaregard intrusion, which is in the bottom left here, and the Bushveld, which I think you'll remember we said was like the biggest, uh, biggest laid intrusion on Earth. It's absolutely massive. And we're going to use these as examples of two kind of like end members of, uh, of intrusions. OK. So um, what are magma chambers and intrusions? Um, magma chambers are locations where magma is stored in uh, volcanic systems. Uh, conduits are magma transport pathways. Um, so these would typically be dikes, but it doesn't have to be. So dike is a, is a vertical, planar, sheet-like intrusion. Um, and in intrusions, are, and, and fil they're filled with intrusive rocks, these are the kind of frozen igneous rem remnants of magma chambers or conduits. Um, so there's a few different types um, that we will talk about. Uh, layered mafic intrusions, which is going to be the focus of this part of the lecture. Dikes, which I think you'll have encountered in first year. Again, those are the vertical sheets. And sills are more like horizontal sheets. Um, in this image, you can see there's some, some other kind of ex uh, other names. Uh, so there's lacoliths and lopoliths, depending on whether they bend upwards or downwards. But um, not too, too fussed about those today. Uh, plutons, we will come back to. the overwhelmingly felsic, so we'll talk about plutons uh, when we talk about granites. Okay, so, so far in this course, we've basically just talked about volcanic rocks. We did have a little bit of a, a talk about uh, ultramafic cumulates and gabbros uh, in relation to mid-ocean ridges. But the, the thing with volcanic rocks is that what we're overwhelmingly looking at is this kind of leftover melt after some crystallization has happened. Um, and we've got some phenocrysts in it, right? So we've got some of the crystals that crystallized from earlier melts. Um, intrusive rocks, um, these are often going to be cumulates, and that's because they've accumulated crystals. Um, and when we look at in intrusive rocks, it's kind of the opposite. We're overwhelmingly looking at the crystals that were produced from the differentiation, but we sometimes have a bit of melt that's uh, left in between those cumulus grains, the, the, the main crystals, uh, and some melt can get trapped in, and then that will crystallize. So this uh, is just the, the, the figure that I showed you with the mid-ocean ridges, and today we're focusing more on the intrusive cumulate side of things, not on the, on the volcanic side. So there's two main ideas for how you form cumulates. Um, the first one is this kind of sinking or flotation idea, and th this is probably like the original idea for how cumulates form. Um, the idea here is that you have a magma, it starts crystallizing minerals, the majority of those are going to be denser than the magma, and they will sink, and they will fall, and basically make a layer at the bottom of a magma chamber. And so in that layer, you have uh, the crystals, and then in between, you'll have some amount of melt left over. Um, now, overwhelmingly, crystals are going to sink. Uh, the exception here is that plagioclase can sometimes be less dense than the magmas that it crystallizes from, and so it will float. Um, the other idea is this idea of kind of in situ, which is, is just Latin for in place uh, crystallization. And in situ crystallization uh, would be where the crystals are actually forming on the edges of a magma chamber as it cools. Um, so you can see that on the right hand side there. And there's no, if, if for a pure in situ um, crystallization, there's no sinking or floating. It basically, the crystals are forming, uh, stuck to the sides of the magma chamber because that's where the cooling is greatest, so that's where we get the most crystallization, and they stay there. 
So these are kind of like end members, and in nature, there is probably some element of both of these happening. And in most magma chambers, it won't be purely one or purely the other. It'll be some mixture. But we'll talk about that uh, more later. When it comes to describing cumulates, um, you can pretty much just divide them up into cumulus grains. These are kind of our equivalent of phenocrysts, right? They're the big crystals that have either grown in place of its in situ or they have settled from a magma if, uh, if they're sinking or, or rising. Um, and in between those, you'll have, again, some amount of trapped liquid, and that will crystallize to make intercumulus material. Um, so these could be intercumulus grains. Um, yeah. And cumulates are, are, are classified based on the proportions of cumulus versus intercumulus. So on the left, you've got orthocumulates, which I think is about 70% uh, um, cumulus grains, and then the rest in intercumulus. Uh, mesocumulate, which m I think is something like 85 to 93 percent cumulus grains, and a uh, and little bit of intercumulus, and then adcumulates, which have no, uh, very little or no obvious intercumulus material. So it looks like they're almost entirely made up of, of cumulus grains. This figure is, uh, is from the paper that originally defined this, and you can see they're talking here about a, a, a plagioclase dominated cumulate. So the cumulus grains are all plagioclase, and then in between, in these different examples, you have different amounts of intercumulus pyroxene, olivine, oxides, and some kind of uh, quartz-bearing crappy thing that's the last, last thing to crystallize. So on the right, you can see that essentially the whole uh, cumulate rock is made of plagioclase, so that would be an adcumulate. Um, here's a couple of real-world examples of what uh, orthocumulates look like. So these are the ones which are, I think, 70 to 85 percent cumulus grains. Um, and th here, the cumulus grains are the kind of like, almost like you can see there's this 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 framework of uh, in the top right, it's olivine, and they're all touching each other because they're all resting on one another. Um, and in between, there are these plagioclase crystals that are clearly growing around the uh, olivine because they're just filling in whatever space is there. They don't, they're not showing like a normal plagioclase shape. Um, but they're actually quite big grains and they're enveloping some of the olivines. So this is what you call an oikocryst. Um, and then the texture as a whole is called poikilitic. Um, there's another example at the bottom, which is a more gabroic composition. And in this one, the plagioclase is forming the cumulus grains. You can see there's these kind of like blocky tabular plagioclase shapes. They're not perfectly euhedral, but you can see that they, they have some of that expected plagioclase shape. And in that case, it's clinoproxene that's growing around and filling in all the spaces. So the bottom one would be um, plagioclase cumulus grains with uh, clinoproxene oikocrysts. Um, and so this is more or less... Uh, a frozen version of what we'd call a crystal mush. And just talk about that here. Um, crystal mush is basically something in between a, a solidified cumulate rock and a crystal free magma. Um, and we have mentioned it before in terms of the mid ocean ridges. Um, in the figure that I showed you, we had this big mush in the uh, just below the ridge. So this is a mixture of magma and crystals uh, on its. The, the, some of the magma goes on to become uh, to be erupted um, as mid-ocean ridge basalts, and some of it will freeze, and that will be our, our gabbros underneath. So in magma chambers, we can uh, this, this could be you know this kind of broad mush zone as as we might expect under a mid-ocean ridge, or there can be this thing called like a solidification front, and this is basically a, a gradational change between purely solid cumulate and uh, crystal-free magma. And there'll be this mushy zone with varying amounts of, of crystals and liquid in there. On the other extreme end, we have these adcumulates. And so when we look at them in a microscope, all we can see are cumulate grains, uh, cumulus grains. We can't see any obvious intercumulus material. Um, on the top right, that's a, a dunite. Uh, it's actually from a kamatiite flow. So kamatiites crystallize a load of olivine, and they're actually hot enough and uh, runny enough that the crystals can just sink to the bottom and, uh, and make a, a, a completely accumulate layer, even within a lava flow. 
Um, at the bottom, there's a plagioclase ad cumulate, and this is a special type of rock called an, an anorthosite, and they're called that from anorthite, uh, the, the calcium end member of plagioclase. And when it's basically pure plagioclase, you call it an anorthosite. So there's a lot of debate about the origin of ad cumulates, and I don't think we're going to go into it too much, but just want you to, to be aware of this. If you imagine that the crystals kind of like either grow in situ or settle down and you have some, some amount of cumulus grains and some amount of intercumulus trapped liquid, you need to make an ad cumulate, you need to get rid of that liquid, right? Because let's say it was a basaltic magma and we've crystallized a bunch of plagioclase. The melt in between should go on to crystallize all these other phases, all these other minerals we've been dealing with, right? Some clinoproxene, some uh, oxides maybe, but instead we're just getting pure plagioclase. So you need some way of removing that. One, one option is that basically the weight of other crystals pressing down and it squeezes the liquid out. That's a process called compaction and we end up with like very, very pure cumulus. Uh, or the other option is you have some sort of compositional convection, which could be that the uh, intercumulus liquid and because it's had crystals removed from it, it can end up being uh, denser or less dense than the magma above and you start getting a, a convection uh, that, that basically pulls out the intercumulus stuff, replenishes it with magma that, that hasn't crystallized as much plagioclase and can keep crystallizing it. But we won't go into that in a, in a ton of detail, but just so you know, there's these options. Is everyone following so far? Okay, so we're gonna talk about a bit of geochemistry now. Um, so yeah, um, in cumulates, um, the compatible elements, uh, basic geochemistry just basically ends up reflecting the cumulus minerals. Right, because the, the, the compatible elements go into those minerals and we have a lot of those in a cumulate rock. The incompatible elements do not go into the cumulus minerals. So these uh, only really, they're only really present in any intercumulus melt that was trapped in there. So I'm gonna ask you guys to predict for me what you would expect the major element composition of a dunite to be, uh, a dunite cumulate. So dunite is pure olivine. And then I want you to try and predict what the rare earth element pattern is, okay? So is anyone uh, willing to take a stab on what the major elements might look like? Go ahead, yeah. Uh, magnesium, iron, and uh, silicon, and oxygen. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, in terms of major elements, it should look very similar to olivine, right? Because if we have a dunite cumulate, it's going to be more than 70% olivine. Um, so the major elements are going to be very close to olivine compositions. Does anyone want to try and predict what the rare earth element pattern is going to look like? Yeah? I think maybe it would be sort of flat because a lot of the parts would be enriched or depleted. Yeah. Um, so if we had a, let's say, if we had a magma with a flat rare earth element pattern, what's the dunite cumulate going to look like compared to that? That would be lower because of a lower yeah. It, exactly, because we, we are, we're taking this, this intercumulus melt, right, uh, and, or, or, or trapped liquid, and we're just diluting it with a bunch of olivine. And olivine doesn't take in rare earths, so we're just going to lower it. So what that looks like, um, this is from some work I did. So up in the top there, you can see that's just a plot of iron against magnesium. And the FO is the, the forsterite content of kind of ideal olivines. Um, and you can see here that these, these are uh, dunites, which are very, very pure olivine. And most of the bulk rock compositions, which are the um, green triangles and orange circles, they plot very, very close to those ideal olivine compositions. So we basically just have olivine with a very small amount of melt. And if we look at the rare earth elements, um, the cool thing here is we can actually compare between potential different melts that got trapped in there. And you can see um, the red dash line at the top is uh, the composition of basalts in this area. The green solid line is the composition of a weird type of rock called, called a bononite that's also in the same area. And, if, and the black dash line at the bottom is, is the rare earth element pattern with olivine just on its own. And basically, we can just add different amounts of those melts in. And most of these dunites in terms of the rare earths can be matched by uh, pure olivine with between 3 and 20% melt trapped in between it. And that actually matches pretty well with the, with the major elements as well. So, yeah. 
All right. Um, yeah, the main points from there is that magma chambers are where magma is stored in volcanic systems. Uh, conduits are transport pathways. And when these cool and solidify, they make intrusions. These could be dikes, sills, layered mafic intrusions, or uh, plutons. Um, and intrusions are made up of cumulate rocks, which consist of cumulus grains and intercumulus material, which represents some sort of trapped liquid that freezes. Does anyone have any questions about that? OK, that's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, we'll talk a bit about the Skyguard intrusion um, next. And the reason for talking about this is it's a really perfect example of something called closed system fractionation. Um, and I'll tell you what that is in a sec. So in magma chambers, um, there's this concept of either having a closed system or an open system. And a closed system is really simple, and that's why we're dealing with it first. In a closed system, you get a single batch of magma that makes its way up into a magma chamber and it gets stuck there. And it basically just sits and it cools and it crystallizes. And then we can see a bunch of different cumulates related to the cooling and crystallization of that magma. An open system, um, which we'll deal with at the start of the next part of the lecture, um, is where we're either gaining or losing mass from the magma chamber. And this could be you know, just one event or it could be several events. And so the way we can lose mass from the magma chamber is we can erupt, we can have degassing, which is where um, volatiles like water or carbon dioxide form bubbles and then basically fizz out the top. Um, we could also have um, magma moving up from one magma chamber into a higher magma chamber. It doesn't have to erupt, but it's, it's leaving the magma chamber in some way. Um, we can gain mass uh, by something called recharge, which is where you have a fresh batch of magma that's added into a magma chamber that's already been cooling and crystallizing. Um, or we can have assimilation. And assimilation can happen in a couple of ways. Um, the heat from the magma chamber itself can basically melt the surrounding crust, and then that melt can be added. Or sometimes um, the magma will kind of um, progress along cracks and you can actually have chunks um, situations where big chunks of the roof just crack and fall in. So that's often called uh, stoping. Um, but if that then melts, then that is another form of assimilation. So we're adding mass by melting the, the surrounding uh, crust. Okay, so the scare guard intrusion. Um, I mentioned at the end of last week, it's in East Greenland. Um, it's about 56 million years old, and it's part of the North Atlantic Igneous Province. And that was the, uh, the large igneous province that, that was formed by the Iceland plume, um, which is still kind of causing eruptions today under Iceland. Um, it's really famous if you're a geologist because it's, it's this almost perfect example of closed system fractional crystallization. Um, the parental magma, so this is the, the composition of the magma that first came into the, uh, into the magma chamber, is fairly evolved, kind of like flood basalty looking uh, magma. So it's in equilibrium with something like uh, Forsterite 80 olivine. And can anyone remember, is, is that a direct mantle melt if it's got Forsterite 80 olivine? Go ahead. Uh, no. No. So if it's direct straight from the mantle, it would be Forsterite 89. So we've lost some magnesium already. There's already been some crystallization deeper down in the system. You can see on the top right, there's a map of, of where it is in Greenland. And then um, it's in East Greenland. It's very uninhabited. I think there's only a couple of towns out there and quite remote. And you can see it's in next to a fjord and there's a bunch of glaciers crisscrossing it. So quite a cool area. Um, it's also uh, overlain by these flood basalts that are also part of the North Atlantic Igneous province and that formed uh, roughly the same time, probably a little bit before the, the magma chamber did. And then on the bottom you can see um, it's divided up into these different series and we'll, we'll talk about that now. So this um, magma chamber is, as a whole, it's about four kilometers thick, uh, which sounds really big, but it's, it's actually towards the smaller end of some of these <laughs> magma chambers that you get in large igneous provinces. So about 300 kilometer cubed of, uh, of magma. Um, so still, it's pretty big. But, um, what you can see is, is 
it's, it's more or less divided into these three series. So at the bottom, we have this uh, layered series, and it's all these ones, uh, LZA, uh, LZB, LZC, MZ, UZA, UZB, UZC. And at the sides, we have something called the marginal uh, border series. This is something that crystallized in from the walls. And then at the roof, we have the upper border series. And these basically have the same crystallization series in each one of them. So they're all crystallizing in from the edges and then they meet at this thing called the sandwich horizon. And I guess that's just because the melt that was left over got sandwiched between stuff crystallizing from, from every side. So the fact that we have the same crystallization se uh, sequence in every single one of them means that some of the crystallization must be in situ, right? Because if we were having this, uh, this, this concept of the crystals just floating or sinking, then we should see completely different stuff at the top and the bottom. If it was, um, I'm just going to skip back to that slide actually. Um, if it was purely floating or sinking, then we should see all the high density crystals at the bottom and all the most primitive um, cumulus at the bottom. And then we should see this gradual progression up through more and more evolved uh, cumulates. So if we think back to our basalt crystallization, it might be olivine, uh, dunite, and then maybe a troctolite, and then a, a gabbro on top, and then some, some weird stuff above that. And then we shouldn't ever see uh, troctolites or dunites at the top because they'd have all been crystallized out at the bottom. So the fact that we see the same series uh, at the top, the bottom, and the sides means that at least some of this was growing in from the edges, right? So that's the in-situ model. Um, what's really cool in this Skagard stratigraphy is, is because we basically just have one batch of, of magma crystallizing, we can see this progression of different fractional crystallization assemblages uh, from this magma. So I've just, even though this, this, uh, this diagram shows the stratigraphy for, for kind of all three series, but I've just put the names on the, on the, uh, the layered series. Um, you can see the lines joining to the uh, marginal border series and the upper border series, and you can see that they've actually got the same uh, the same kind of labels, right? So we, we still have we see LZA in all three of them, and that's just to show the fact that, that these are basically the same crystallization assemblages. So if we go from bottom to top, we can see these uh, systematic variations in the minerals that are crystallizing, and this is called phase layering. Um, you know, phase is just another way of saying that it's, it's a mineral or a, or a fluid or something. So this is layering in, in the minerals, uh, in the mineral assemblages that are crystallizing from the magma. So at the bottom, we have a troctolite. So by the time the magma reached this magma chamber, it had already crystallized olivine and plagioclase and basically crystallized a whole bunch of it at the bottom. Then you can see there's this little symbol saying orge plus. So orge is for orgite. And so that's when we start to see clinoproxene as a cumulus phase in, in these cumulates. So then we're crystallizing the gabbro. Further up, you can see MT plus. Uh, MT is how people sometimes write magnetite. So this is uh, iron oxide. So we're still crystallizing the gabbro, but we've got olivine, plagioclase, clinoproxene, and some oxides. And then slightly above that, we have all minus. So at that point, olivine actually stops crystallizing. So the melt has got two evolved um, to crystallize olivine. Then it's what you call an oxide gabbro, plagioclase, clinoproxene, and uh, iron oxides. And then above that, um, we see a strange thing where olivine actually jumps back in. So there's all plus. But um, the composition of these olivines is completely different. Um, all the olivines we've been looking at so far have been quite forsteritic, right? The MG numbers have been like 80, 89, that kind of range. Um, this is a very uh, iron-rich olivine, so it's a, a phaolitic olivine, um, which is the iron M member. So that's called a ferrodiorite. Um, doesn't matter about the name exactly, but it's, it's basically an iron-rich evolved um, diuretic uh, cumulate. Further up, um, we have another type of ferrodiorite, and there's, we've gone past this AP+, plus, and that's because apatite has, has joined. And then right in the last bits to crystallize, both from the, the bottom, the side, and the top, um, we have these, um, I've just called them weird wollastonite bearing rocks. Um, the, the, I think the proper name for them is something like a ferrobustamite bearing diorite. And uh, ferrobustamite is basically this type of um, wollastonite structured mineral. If you remember back to the pyroxene tetrahedron 
everything over 50% uh, wollastonite content was no longer a pyroxene. So this is one of those minerals that's in this wollastonite structure, but it's basically calcium iron silicate. Um, but yeah, so we wouldn't normally expect to see that crystallizing from a basalt because the amount of crystallization and the amount of uh, magma evolution we need to get to this is, is quite extreme. Um, the other thing you notice is that throughout this whole series, we have plagioclase present. And the plagioclase composition varies systematically. So on the right of all those orge plus, mt plus, all minus, and so on, there's uh, an followed by a number. So that's the anothite content of the plagioclase. And you can see that that is just systematically um, dropping as we, as we go through. And that's exactly what we expect, right? As we, as we cool and crystallize, we go from these anothite calcium-rich plagioclases to the albite N member, which is more sodium-rich. And this is called cryptic layering because you can't just look at it and see that it's there. You have to go measure the compositions. But what we're seeing here, this is ex exactly like Bowen's reaction series that we talked about, this mineralogical evolution of, of magmas. Go ahead, Bessie. So what about the alumin, the, the new influx of alumin or whatever? The, that's, that doesn't fit with the Bowen's. Yeah, so that's why I said similar. It's not exactly Bowen's reaction series, but you have to remember that with Bowen's reaction series, it's just like, that's just a, a generalization. Um, but the, the, the principle is the same, is that we're seeing a continuous change in the feldspar composition. We're seeing these discontinuous changes in the, uh, the magnes ferromagnesium minerals. So we periodically, we're getting a new ferromagnesium mineral or they're disappearing or reappearing. But is that because there's new magma entering no, not at all. So it's just that once, once you've crystallized, um, once you've crystallized enough of this oxide gabbro, um, we basically, yeah, it, it's just the the new mineral that's crystallizing is a really iron rich olivine, and it's just because the composition of the magma has changed so much. So if we, we'll we'll talk about it um, in the in the next part of the lecture, but. Um, if we had a flux of new magma coming in, we might expect to see these magnesium-rich olivines coming back, right? So we'd have another another troctolite kind of thing crystallizing. Um, but this is just a this is just a continuous crystallization um, series. And as I said, in most in most cases, um, if you're just crystallizing basalt, you're not going to get to these weird, really weird compositions. So it's actually quite rare that we see uh, phyllitic olivines um, from basalt crystallization. And the number that's next to it, is it anothite? Yeah. The, it, it, that's how much of 100% anothite? Yeah. yeah, that's back to that. Um, do you remember the plagioclase ternary? We have yeah. Yeah. anothite, right? I've got to reverse it for you guys. Anothite, albite, uh, orthoclase. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're going from something that's fairly calcium rich, and as the magma evolves, it's moving towards that uh, yeah. sodium yeah. corner. Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, so what's really cool is because we have just this one, one batch of, um, of magma, we can actually uh, show a really good example of, the, of this trace element uh, fractional crystallization that we talked about last lecture. So at the top here, we've got uh, the, the chromium content in clinoproxene, and at the bottom, we've got nickel in clinoproxene. So if you remember back to the practical, chromium is fairly compatible in clinoproxene, and nickel is not very compatible. Um, so what happens is early on, we, we have intercumulus clinoproxene, but we don't have cumulus clinoproxene. So what, basically once we've formed this kind of mush of uh, olivine and, and plagioclase in the troctolite, um, the liquid that's left over will crystallize clinoproxene. But this is not, this clinoproxene is not being removed from the bulk magma. So even though we're getting into cumulus clinoproxene, the chromium concentrations are basically just staying the same because there's a tiny bit going into olivine, um, but not a lot, and um, nothing much is going on. As soon as we start to get cumulus clinoproxene, we're now removing clinoproxene from the overall magma chamber, and clinoproxene has more chromium than the magma. So um, the, uh, the, the chromium concentrations start to fall. Um, and you can see on the bottom here, this is plotted against the residual liquid fraction. So this is against the amount of melt left in the magma chamber. When we start to crystallize oxides, which is uh, as part of our, our, our gabbro assemblage, uh, 
Um, then the chromium really plummets, and that's because chromium is very, very compatible in, uh, in iron oxides like magnetite. Um, on the bottom, we have uh, nickel, and nickel is not compatible in, in plagioclase, but it is very compatible in olivine. And so in the first uh, part where we're just crystallizing uh, troctolites and then gabbros, the nickel is steadily going down. We have a slight kink when we change from a troctolite to a gabbro because now we're crystallizing uh, some extra clinoproxene that doesn't really take in nickel. Um, and then again, once we get oxides, these oxides, uh, nickel is also very compatible in these oxides. So it really goes off the cliff. And so when we've got down to the last, you know, last little bits of melt in the magma chamber, the resi residual li liquid fraction is less than about 10% then we have virtually no chromium or nickel left in the melt. It's been, it's been removed. Uh, does that make sense there? Good. For incompatible elements, it's basically the exact opposite. And this is from the exact same paper and the exact same samples that they measured. But in this case, they're measuring the barium in plagioclase. And barium is... Uh, it can be compatible in alkali feldspars, in, in you know, potassium feldspar, orthoclase, but it's not very compatible in plagioclase. So what's going on here is from the early stages of the intrusion, we're crystallizing our troctolites, then our gabbros, our oxide gabbros, then our weird you know, iron-rich olivine uh, ferrodiorites, and basically barium's just going up and up and up and up. And it's getting more and more concentrated in the melt, so even though it is incompatible in plagioclase, the melt concentrations are getting so high that towards the end we start to see uh, some, some relatively high barium contents in the plagioclase. So this is, again, this is exactly what we saw uh, last week with the fractional crystallization in, uh, uh, behavior of incompatible elements. All right. So magma chambers behave as closed systems when we just have a single batch of magma that's uh, crystallizing without any addition of new melts, which is called recharge, uh, any significant crustal assimilation or any eruptions. And Skerkegaard in intrusion is a, is a very good example of this. It shows this stratigraphic uh, phase and cryptic layering, which is basically following uh, Bowen's reaction series, where we have a continuous change in our feldspars and these discontinuous changes in the ferromagnesium minerals. Um, the trace element variations are a pretty good match to perfect uh, fractional crystallization. Okay, any questions on that section? Yeah? I think I was a bit confused about um, the layering in the yeah. scattered intrusion. Um, does, is, it, is, is it both in situ and... We're going to talk about all about that in yeah, a sec, yes. and it's actually super confusing, so yeah. don't worry, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because there's both... Mm -hmm. But there's also stuff singing to the bottom. Yep, yep, there is. Uh, <laughs> so we know at least, we, we know because we have the same sequence, we at least have to have some in situ crystallization, right? Because we see the same sequence on the, on the roof, on the walls, and at the bottom. So to some extent, things are crystallizing in place. But yeah, this is a, this is a, a really complicated question. We will get into it a bit, but this is still actively debated, the kind of role of in situ versus... versus uh, crystal sinking yeah but I hope that the one thing you can take away is it can't be purely crystal sinking otherwise we'd see all the most evolved stuff at the top all the most primitive stuff at the bottom and there would be no roof or wall series it would just be this con continuous change between the two uh, yeah Emma can you just repeat you had said continuous layering of deep and discontinuous layering of deep mm. oh yeah yeah range, sorry yeah yeah so we see this continuous variation in the feldspar compositions. Um, so we go from this calcium-rich plagioclase feldspar to sodium-rich, uh, and that's just it's just gradually changing throughout the intrusion, as you can see in the anorthite numbers written on the on the right-hand side there. And with the ferromagnesium minerals, which are your olivines, pyroxenes, um, oxides, all that kind of thing, we're getting discontinuous changes. So minerals are appearing and then some, sometimes disappearing. Bastien? But it does get more evolved when you go up. Yeah, until you hit the sandwich horizon, and then it gets more primitive if you keep going up. Yeah, the sandwich horizon is the um, marginal, where it's, the margin starts. It's the join between the layered uh, upper border series and okay. the marginal border series. 
So if it was crystallizing perfectly from the edges, then we'd expect it to be like, you know, just, just most primitive always on the edge and, and most evolved always in the middle. And, you know, we're, we're sort of seeing that, but, but it's a bit more complicated. So let's, let's uh, talk about that some more. <laughs> so I, I think I promised some of you on the, on the field trip that we'd talk about sedimentary structures and magma chambers, because, I mean, I think this is just really cool. Um, so yeah, uh, ScareGuard has got some amazing examples of this. So as I kind of said before, um, there's these two main end member models for cumulates. And in ScareGuard, um, th this is taken from the textbook that I think probably has it slightly wrong. Um, I basically called up one of, the, one of the experts on this to try and get it set because I couldn't figure it out from reading the papers. So. Um, but anyway, the two main end members. Uh, the first one is that we have crystallization throughout. And what's happening there is the magma chamber, it's a big hot blob of liquid and it's colder at the top than the bottom, so you're gonna get convection system, right? So the whole magma chamber is convecting, and this is kind of the old school idea for it, is that crystals begin to nucleate free floating in that magma, right? So when I say nucleate, I mean that's the, the first step of forming a new crystal. And then they basically settle and hit the floor and leave layers. Now, there's a couple of ways that can happen. It could be this kind of uniform rain of crystals, or, or here they've shown it as these crystal-rich density currents. And so density current in this case would be similar to a turbidite. You have a mixture of magma and denser crystals, and they flow downhill, and they deposit a layer, you know, de depositing the biggest grains first, or the densest grains in this case, and you basically get like a, a gradation, like a turbidite. Um, the second idea is this in situ crystallization from crystal mush. And in this case, the crystals are all, they're not nucleating in the main body of the magma. They're actually nucleating at the edges. And I did delete a bit of stuff from this figure because I think the way the textbook had it was unnecessarily complicated. But um, essentially, there's some argument about, you know, the, not the whole magma chamber is convecting. Maybe there's this little layered convection. Anyway, the idea is that they are, they are growing in from the sides. So these are kind of the extreme uh, interpretations of it. And the truth is probably going to be somewhere in between, but we've got to figure out where it is in between. Um, so there is a, a difficulty. If you, if you go for a pure in situ model, so we're saying all the cumulates formed exactly where they are now. No, there's, no, there's no crystal settling. There's no moving of, of crystals once they've formed. Um, and we, we, I've already said that there must be some in situ because we have this exact same series at the top, the bottom, and the sides. But the big problem with this is that the, most of the heat is going to be lost through the roof, and that's because the roof is colder. It's higher up. It's closer to the surface. So we should be losing most heat through the top. That means we should have most crystallization at the top. And if we have most crystallization at the top, then the upper border series should be the thickest if it's pure in situ. Right? And we should have quite a thin series at the bottom, uh, a little bit thicker at the sides and thick at the top. That's not what we see at all, right? We've got the, the, the layered series is the biggest and then the upper border series is, is substantially thinner. Um, so we'll talk through some of the, the observations of this and then, and then come back to that question. So ScareGuard is full of this, this modal layering and what I mean by modal layering is we're still, we still have the overall same rock types, right? You know, th this is still a gabbro, for example. But we see changes in the amounts of minerals, this is the mineral modes, um, across different layers. Um, and the origin of this is, is still debated. One option is it's these density currents, so the turbidite style deposition, denser stuff at the bottom, light stuff at the top. Um, and the other option is there's this in situ process where basically different minerals are nucleating. This, uh, they're able to form new crystals at different rates. Another feature we can see in ScareGuard are these troughs. And these are near the edges of the intrusion. Um, so they're generally coming down from the marginal border series into the layered series. And I think these are incredibly cool. You, you get the same sort of modal grading that I was just talking about, then the, the modal layering. Um, but basically, you can imagine this like the big turbidite canyon that we saw in Spain, right? Does everyone remember there was that kind of, you know, huge, like, 
U-shaped kind of turbidite canyon. And then it was filled up with these turbidites that have these grade, uh, gradations between coarse grains at the bottom and, and, and fine grains at the top. And this is basically the same thing, but within a magma chamber. So there's some sort of magmatic density current that's coming down, maybe scouring out some of the cumulates that are already there, and then it's depositing these graded minerals. So this is, this is good evidence for the fact that some of this layering is from, is from density currents. Go ahead, Anna. Can you show me on uh, the image, yeah. that one, where that is? Uh, I don't, yeah, I don't have it, I don't have an image with it layered, uh, with it labeled, sorry. But essentially these, these exist. Uh, somewhere down here, down, so down the sides coming into the layered series. Um, I'd have to get a better figure to show that. But there's um, the the next slide we'll talk about will probably help with this a bit. Um, there's actually this this whole zone that's called the cross bedded zone, and so this uh, again, like what we're seeing sedimentary structures in these. So we actually have cross bedding in the mineral layers. So again, this is evidence of these flows coming down the side of the magma chamber and being deposited. Um, so yeah, um, there's a picture of it in the textbook, which is a little unclear. And then I picked out a couple here. Uh, in the left, you can see these dark layers that are clearly terminating against some sort of channel, right? Which has got that kind of lens shape. So this is almost like a little river channel, but again, we're in a magma chamber. And on the right, you can see there's some, uh, some cross trough bedding. Um, so really cool stuff. The other thing we can see is that the Skagard intrusion is absolutely full of these uh, autoliths or xenoliths. So these are blocks that fell from the roof and they range from things. On the left here, you can see there's a picture of a, uh, with a hammer and outlined in the kind of pale material is, is a block. Uh, on the right, you can see that's a whole cliff face and the size of the block in it is that, is that pale bit outlined in red. So, we have everything from like tiny little chunks, like a few centimeters across to like huge, you know, size of a building, bits of rock that have fallen in. And these are both chunks of the upper border series. Um, and they are also chunks of the, the host rocks, of the magma chamber. So literally the, the, the roof of the magma chamber has collapsed. Um, and what, what happens is these are disrupting the layering and then the layering is being formed around them. So this is just like what you see in a diamic type. Are you guys familiar with that? It's a, a glacial rock. No, okay. So diamictite is the same idea, but uh, if you have a if you have um, a sea with sediment in it and an ice sheet extends over and the ice sheet has eroded some rocks, when the ice sheet melts, it basically drops these rocks into the sediment below, and so you get this soft sedimentary layers that are deformed by a rock falling into it. So. This is like a, a really strong evidence for like glaciations in the geological past. And this is the same idea, but again, in a magma chamber, we have these big blocks falling from the roof and just squadging into the, the cumulates that are already there and then cumulates being deposited around them. So how do we put this all together? Um, basically, the truth is, as I mentioned, somewhere in between these two extreme uh, models. Most of the crystallization is beginning at the roof and the sides um, where the cooling rate is greatest. It can also happen in convective downwellings and I'll talk about that in a sec. But um, it's really not possible to create new crystals in the middle of the magma chamber. And again, I'll talk about that in a sec. So we start forming these mineral cores of cumulus grains at the roof and at the sides where there's, where there's downwellings, downwellings. And these cores are basically, uh, once they start to crystallize, the mixture of the, the melt plus the crystal cores is denser than the melt in the rest of the magma chamber. So then we form a density current, that's like our turbidite. And these minerals are then falling to the bottom of the magma chamber in these density currents and they're being gradually deposited out into these long, uh, into these large modal uh, layered beds. Um, the roof and the walls are also unstable. Um, I didn't show this, but as, as this magma chamber was, was forming, there was rifting going on, so there might have been earthquakes, there could have been uh, bits basically shaken loose and falling. Um, and once we deposited these density currents, the intercumulus phases then crystallize more or less in situ, so basically filling in the gaps between these cumulus grains. Um, I said there wasn't much crystallization in the middle of the magma chamber, and this is it's a really similar idea to what we talked about with mantle melting but instead of the 
uh, adiabat being steeper than the solidus, here we're talking about the adiabat is steeper than the liquidus. So the adiabatic gradient is the change in temperature just from changes in pressure. So as we go, um, as we go up in the magma chamber, the liquidus is actually, um, the liquidus is falling in temperature faster than the adiabatic gradient. So if we had a crystal here and we moved it upwards, it would actually hit its melting temperature and it would melt. The opposite is true if it's descending. If we have something that's above the liquidus and it descends, it will actually hit the liquidus and start to crystallize. So we can only make new crystals in these areas where it's descending. And that's easiest near the sides of the magma chamber where we've got high amounts of cooling. So I think in some way, shape, or form, we've, we've answered that question. <laughs> so we've got a mix of in situ and uh, crystal settling. But the crystal settling, it's not this traditional view of just crystals raining down. It's these big density currents and blocks falling from the roof and all sorts of cool stuff. So, yeah. So this is still debated. Um, what I'm telling you is the, the, the best interpretation I could get from, from the experts. And uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully it holds up. Um, but yeah, there's a debate whether magma chambers crystallize in situ from the outside in, or whether the crystals form throughout the ma magma chamber and settle downwards. Um, a scare guard, we got something in between that. Most of the crystallization is starting at the top and the sides. And then we have this range of sedimentary processes that are basically redistributing minerals towards the base of the magma chamber. Go ahead. Those sedimentary um, processes also, um, what's it called? also explain like the, the phase layer in the it's, um, that's still this progressive fractional crystallization because if you think about it, whatever minerals are crystallizing in the, the magma chamber is going to be really well mixed in, in the center because you've just got this crazy convection because it's so hot and it's losing heat. Um, so as we deposit troctolites, right, we're removing olivine and plagioclase, the, the, melt, the melt composition in the rest of the magma chamber is still evolving along this kind of fractional crystallization path. So even though the crystals are being formed elsewhere and then deposited in these density so currents, still we're still progressively evolving the magma. So, I mean, if you think about um, the size of these modal layers, I mean, um, the one on the right there, I think that's like a small book or something. So maybe, maybe each one of these uh, modal layers is like 5 to 20 centimetres thick. But when we go back to our overall... Um, stratigraphy of the magma chamber here we've got like you know three kilometers or so so these modal layers are very small compared to this the overall phase layering go ahead is this representative of how crystallization always happens in a closed chamber or is it just scattered um so it has to be big enough to have uh really active convection yeah. so if you have a very small magma chamber then you probably won't see all these sedimentary processes and stuff. Um, I think what's fairly, is uh, quite unique about Skergard, maybe not completely unique, is it is just so close to perfect fractional crystallization. And um, when we talk about Bushveld, you see there's all these other processes that can disrupt what's going on. Um, yeah, so this is, this is probably like the extreme end of things. It's a, it's a big closed fractional magma chamber, but yeah, it's... Um, it has to be big enough for the yeah, I think some things like the, 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 phase, the phase layering, right, this progression, this is what you would expect in gradual fractional crystallization of any closed system. You know, it, obviously the minerals might change if the magma is a different composition, but you should see this progression from primitive to evolved. Um, so it would be more like a regular bones reaction? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, the bones one, I think, because that has horn blend in it, doesn't it? So that's uh, probably for subduction zone magmas, you don't, you don't always see amphiboles, you don't always see biotite, so, yeah. But yeah, this is, this is kind of one end of things. This is perfectly closed, big magma chamber, and yeah. All right, I think that's all I had for this lecture, so does anyone have any further questions? Okay. Um, take 10 minutes and then meet again. <laughs>